Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar, Know Your Rights, Health Insurance Updates and Open Enrollment for 2024. This presentation is intended to give general information and is not intended as legal advice. This webinar also does not establish an attorney-client relationship. There will be time for Q&A after the presentation. This presentation is being recorded. However, when I do the question and answer time, that presentation part will not be recorded. I also welcome questions during the presentation if they would be beneficial for the group. One last thing, I also want to say that I hope to be able to answer your questions, but there may be instances I might have to tell you I don't know it, either because it's not information I have offhand or it might be too specific for today. However, I encourage you to fill an online intake with us so that we can properly research the information. This presentation is part of the Know Your Rights series, which is supported by a generous grant from CGEN. All of the previous webinars are available at, on the CLRC's YouTube page. We still have one webinar left in the series, and I hope that if you have not registered already that you will register for it. It's November 9th, as you can see on your screen. And even if you're not sure if you can attend, please register and you will get a copy of, a, a, rather a link to the webinar after that presentation is recorded. The CLRC stands for the Cancer Legal Resource Center. We are a program of the Disability Rights Legal Center. The CLRC provides information and resources to people affected by cancer nationwide, including patients, care survivors, caregivers, and healthcare professionals. Our resources are free, regardless of income. People often ask, what does cancer have to do with the law? This is a list of some cancer-related legal issues. Cancer affects the patient, survivors, families, healthcare professionals, and impacts many different areas of the law. If someone has a legal question and is affected by cancer, whether or not the topic is listed here, they can contact the CLRC for more information. The CLRC now has a self-help legal clinic from a generous grant from CGEN. There are still upcoming dates, and the next dates will be the UC Irvine Child Family Cancer Center on October 19th. And again, this is, of course, as of the date of this recording, um, and City of Hope Comprehensive Cancer Center in Duarte, October 24, 2023. If someone wants the CLRC self-help clinic to come to their cancer patient services center or comprehensive cancer center, they can tell their doctors or patient navigators about us and their cancer center may reach out to us to see if something can be arranged in the future. The CLRC also has a professional panel, which includes attorneys from across the country who help those with cancer if a caller needs help with a matter in their state and practice area. You saw on an earlier slide the practice areas that attorneys handle, but just to recap some of them, landlord-tenant, health insurance matters, medical malpractice, estate planning, employment law, and divorce law. It's a minimal commitment. All that the attorney agrees to do is a half hour consultation with someone that has contacted the CLRC already. It's very easy to apply. It's free to apply. And also, if you are a lawyer listening to this or you know of a lawyer listening to this and you or someone else would want to be a speaker in the future and um, that person is a lawyer, then please do reach out to the Cancer Legal Resource Center. We do look for speakers from time to time. If you would like to view our resources on any number of topics related to cancer, please visit our website. After all, we are the Cancer Legal Resource Center, so there are plenty of resources. Educational webinars like this one are recorded so we can later post them on our YouTube channel for you to share with anyone who may want to learn more about a variety of subjects. If you have questions about today's presentation, please type them in the chat box. I will be leaving time at the end to answer some questions. As I said 
at the beginning of this presentation, that part of the presentation will not be recorded. However, if you have questions about your specific situation or someone you know has a question you want to ask about, please fill out our online intake form at clrcintake.org, as you can see on your screen. After you do so, you can research laws and resources for you, and provide. we can provide you with free customized resources. Everything is confidential. With the generous support of the American Cancer Society and Breakaway from Cancer, the CLRC has a revised version of the Patient Legal Handbook. The handbook provides an introduction to the most common legal issues that a patient diagnosed with cancer is likely to face. It is available to download for free online in English or Spanish by going to our website, www.theclrc.org. Providers can request printed copies shipped to their offices. So let's get to the webinar content. This webinar will give an overview of insurance basics current insurance options, consumer protections, and ways to maintain or change coverage, whether you are shopping on or off the health insurance marketplace. I wanna quickly go through the some of these insurance basics with you. That way, if you are looking to purchase new insurance, you're familiar with the terms you'll be seeing. I know some of this is going to be straightforward and that a lot of you are quite knowledgeable when it comes to your health insurance. However, I just want to make sure that everyone is on the same page. The first thing to remember is that it is the patient's responsibility to understand their coverage and limitations. Saying, I didn't know that wasn't covered, doesn't work as a way to get out of a medical bill. Even when we call our insurance company, there's a recording that says, verification of benefits is not a guarantee of coverage, or something to that effect. We can't always rely on the physicians treating us to know what's covered by our insurance plans and what isn't, or to what extent. Even if your provider's office says that they will call the insurance company to find out or tells you something is covered, it's always a good idea to become familiar with your plan so you understand co-pays, deductibles, and networks. This helps to prevent unforeseen costs. So in part one, we're going to go over some of the basic information everyone should know and understand about insurance. Knowing your insurance company, for example, knowing that it's Blue Shield is not enough. If you call it a doctor's office to make an initial appointment, they'll ask whether it's private insurance. This is because Blue Shield is also a Medicare and Medicaid provider in some states. Not all doctors accept all insurance plans. Private insurance is one you buy as an individual or family or get through your employer. Medicaid is insurance for people who are low income and meet other requirements. If you receive Supplemental Security Income, known as SSI, you should be eligible for Medicaid. Medicare is insurance for people who have been receiving Social Security Disability Income, or SSDI, for two years, or are age 65 years old or older. Private insurance, as well as Medicare Advantage or Medicaid plans, can all be managed care plans, such as HMOs, PPOs, and POS plans. HMO stands for Health Maintenance Organization. HMOs usually have limited choices for their members because members have to select doctors and hospitals from within a participating medical group. This is why they are typically less expensive than a PPO. The other types of private insurance are PPO, stands for Preferred Provider Organization. Here, the network of providers is less limited than HMOs, and physicians are reimbursed at higher rates for services provided. However, PPOs are usually more expensive than HMOs. POS stands for point of service. These plans combine aspects of HMO and PPO plans where you have to get a primary care physician to make specialist referrals like an HMO. Users usually, users usually have to some freedom of choice in providers, even those providers who are out of network, such as with a PPO, but with greater out-of-pocket costs. EPO stands for Exclusive Provider Organization Plan. As a member of the EPO, you can use the doctors and hospitals within the EPO network, but cannot go outside the network for care. There are no out-of-network benefits. Here are some other basic terms to understand. 
copay. That's the fixed amount you pay for a covered health service. This is usually paid when you get the service. Most office visits or specialist visits have a fixed copay amount that you'll either pay in the office or build later. It's a good idea to become familiar with your copays for different services. For example, your insurance company might charge you $20 for office visits and $40 for specialists. Deductible. That's the amount you have to pay each year before your health insurance plan begins to pay. For example, if your deductible is $1,000, your plan won't pay anything until you've paid $1,000 for covered services. So your first visit or visits up to $1,000 may all be out of pocket. Coinsurance. That's usually the amount people are often most surprised about. Most insurance, even the best insurance, doesn't cover 100% of the cost of a visit. People will usually have a coinsurance, which is your share of the cost of a covered healthcare service. It's usually calculated as a percentage. If you paid your copay, but you are billed a random amount like $8.93 for a physical therapy visit that costs $89.30, that's probably 10% coinsurance. So once you meet your deductible, you might have coinsurance on top of your copay. Also, it's very important to know whether or not certain procedures or services require a pre-authorization. You may have to get your doctor to submit a prior authorization to your insurance company in order for a service to be paid. It's also important to understand your limits. I'll use physical therapy as an example. Some plans limit you up to 20 physical therapy visits per year, while other plans allow you to an unlimited number of visits but you have to see your doctor every month for a prescription. So understand your plan's rules about the services you will need. Okay, we have to understand our coverage and read our policies, but where do we find this information? Your evidence of coverage or summary plan description can usually be found on your plan's website. If you have coverage through an employer, you can contact your human resources department to get a copy of the contract if you don't have it. The terms of the policy is the first place to look in determining what is covered. There are many federal and state health insurance regulations regarding services that health plans must provide that would supersede those provided for in an insurance contract. That means there are protections that exist as your rights, whether laid out in the plan or not. An example is covered of pre-existing conditions in annual screenings without needing to pay a copay or deductible. Often all this information is available online through your health insurance company's website. You can also call your insurance company to request a hard copy of their planned documents. If possible, it is best to access this information prior to a time when the patient or yourself is in need of urgent care so at least you know where and how to access it should an urgent medical question arise. Just like with your overall insurance plan, it is a good idea to become familiar with your prescription drug benefits. Medications must first be approved by the Food and Drug Administration or FDA. Until a drug is approved, it cannot legally be given to anyone except through an approved clinical trial or a manufacturer's compassionate use program approved by the FDA. Each plan has a formulary or list of approved med medications. Formulary medications can usually be prescribed without a pre-authorization. Drugs on a formulary are typically grouped into tiers. The tier that your medication is in determines your portion of the drug cost. A typical drug benefit includes three or four tiers. Tier 1 usually includes <clears throat> generic medications. Tier 2 usually includes preferred brand name medications. Tier 3 usually includes non-preferred brand name medications. Tier 4 usually includes specialty and biosimilar medications. Three-tier programs do not have a unique tier for specialty medications. The insurance company, not your physician, decides what is on their formulary. If your provider prescribes a non-formulary medication, Check to see if there's a formulary equivalent. If not, talk with your healthcare provider about requesting a special formulary coverage from your insurance company. Some insurance companies require step therapy. This is the practice of beginning drug therapy for a medical condition with the most cost-effective and safest drug and proceeding to other more costly or risky therapy only if necessary. 
It is important to work with your doctor on appeals to discuss why the prescribed medication provides the patient or you with the best possible outcome. Compassionate use programs allow a manufacturer to give certain individuals a medication that is being tested in clinical trials before the FDA has made a decision about approving or not approving the drug. When the FDA approves a drug, it is approved for certain conditions or indications as you often see on the label. Regardless of what the label says, a physician can legally prescribe an FDA approved drug for any reason. This is called prescribing the drug off label. Note that your insurance company may not approve the coverage. Finally, if an insurance company is repeated you're repeatedly issuing outrageous refusals to provide medication. Some desperate patients have taken to social media, including Twitter, Facebook, and enlisted their friends to publicly demand coverage, often with effective results. So someone affected by cancer can check with their insurance companies to see if they offer a case manager. Case managers can be your go-to person for information about your plan. And often they'll even go through appeals or advocate on your behalf to gain coverage or reduce costs. If your plan does not offer case managers or patient navigators, ask to speak with the same person each time you call a certain department if possible. Then write down the last name or employee number with an extension. It's helpful to keep one to contact for each department and make friends with them because some positive report can go a long way towards saving a lot of money if they spend time finding ways to reduce your costs. You can also avoid having to re-explain your entire story each time you call. Keeping track of who your contact is will assist with keeping accurate records, including careful notes of each phone call, date and time, names of contacts, information covered, authorization numbers, any written co communications, copies of bills, explanation of benefits, check subs, etc. These are all very helpful for appeals. Maintaining an accurate journal or binder of notes will lend credibility to you if there's a discrepancy. While this is a lot of work, Filing systems are helpful to assist with keeping track, and it may be helpful to use a notebook to contain information. Of course, if someone is not helpful and you have them on the phone, I would not save their contact information to speak with them in the future. I would take my chances and hope to speak to someone better. The advice to keep um, requesting the same person is really if they have been helpful. Pre-authorization or prior authorization is a decision by your health insurer that a healthcare service or prescription drug is medically necessary. Pre-authorization doesn't always mean it will be authorized. If you have to get a prior authorization, ask them to send you a written copy of the prior authorization. This should go without saying, but open all your medical mail, even if it seems daunting. If you're opening your mail, you have taken the first step to understanding what you are up against. Sometimes there is no way to appeal decisions if you've waited too long. Thus, it is important to check for mistakes early. Review all bills. Mistakes happen. A simple phone call can sometimes make a real big difference. Review each change. We have a handout on our website with some helpful information about medical billing. You have to play an active role in your healthcare delivery, including the billing payment. It is important not to be caught unaware what your coverage is. If you read something that you don't understand, call customer service. Take notes. Beyond just knowing what kind of plan you have and how much your deductible is, you might need to know what percentage of certain services are covered and who's in your network and whether they reimburse for out-of-network coverage. If you don't have the energy to do this, see if a friend or family member that you trust would be willing to do this for you. Sometimes people ask, how could I help? And maybe you don't have something on your mind at the moment, but maybe that is actually something that you can keep in mind if somebody does offer to help that if you trust the person, feel comfortable having them call on your behalf or call with you, that could be a good idea for them to help. Now that you know what kind of insurance you have and some of the basics about insurance generally and how to maximize that coverage, let's talk a little bit about some of the rules about coverage as well as some of the options you have if you need to purchase new coverage. I want to clarify a few items that refer to different types of private insurance. Group. Purchased by an employer and offered to eligible employees of the company and their eligible dependents. The employer selects the plan or plans to offer to employees. The premium cost is normally split 
between the employer and the employee, and there's a minimum percentage rate the employer must contribute. Individual, you purchase individually for yourself and or your family on your own or through the insurance marketplace created by the Affordable Care Act. The Affordable Care Act is also known as Obamacare. These are often purchased within, with the guidance of an insurance agent to help navigate plan choices and premium costs. Insured is the more traditional way of providing employees with health coverage, where employers buy a health plan from a company and the employer either pays a portion or the whole premium. This is a fully insured plan. Self-insured means an employer just opts to pay the employee's medical bills directly. This is more common in larger companies and often people don't know that their plan is self-insured because an employer may use an insurance company like Blue Shield as a third-party administrator. Grandfather's plans created and purchased before the Affordable Care Act on March 23, 2010 don't have to follow the new rules. Check the date of when your plan was created. Some self-insured plans don't have to follow the Affordable Care Act because they were created before the Affordable Care Act was implemented. Those are called grandfathered plans. Under the Affordable Care Act, which passed in March 2010 and was fully implemented in 2014, a lot of changes took place. One of the most important is insurance plans that count as minimum essential coverage can no longer discriminate against anyone with a pre-existing condition or genetic predisposition, including cancer. The pre-existing condition rule is true for health insurance, not to life insurance, disability insurance, or long-term care insurance. Some states offer protections for people with pre-existing conditions who want to obtain those types of insurance, but this topic is out of our scope for this presentation. For health insurance, you could not be discriminated against because of a pre-existing condition. So for anyone with cancer or a positive genetic test for predisposition to cancer, you can still buy COBRA marketplace insurance and get Medicaid regardless of your health history. Your age and where you live are the only personal characteristics that can be used to set rates. This change is significant because before 2014, gender was a determining factor in establishing premium rates and women were typically being charged a higher rate than men. Now, gender cannot be a determining factor in setting premium rates. Rating area is an area used for determining premium rates, usually by zip code. The premium is based on the average healthcare costs and physician hospital discounts in that area. So costs may be higher if you live in a metropolitan city versus a small town. In late December 2017, Congress successfully passed the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, repealing the penalty for the individual mandate. The repeal of the penalty went into effect in 2019. However, some, someone is still required or mandated to have health insurance because the mandate itself was not repealed. However, a person does not have to pay a fee if they don't comply. Additionally, from tax year 2019 and onward, a person is not responsible for reporting to the IRS whether or not they had minimal acceptable health coverage, but they're still responsible for claiming any premium tax credits and for reporting any advance payments of the previous tax credit received. A person was still responsible for having insurance for the 2018 tax filing season or risk a penalty of a certain amount. Um, and in more recent Affordable Care Act news, um, so some people might have heard of the December 18, 2018 case from a district court in Texas, it ruled that the individual mandate, which is the Affordable Care Act's minimum essential coverage provision, was unconstitutional and invalidated the remaining provisions of the Affordable Care Act as inseverable, and the current and that administration's decision was not to defend the entire ACA. But the individual mandate is that most people must maintain a minimum level of health insurance coverage, and those who do not must pay a financial penalty. So. The latest update is that that decision was overturned by the Supreme Court on June 17, 2021. By a 7-2 margin, the court held that plaintiffs did not have standing to sue and therefore overturned the decision of the district court. So ultimately, the U.S. Supreme Court threw out its latest challenge to the Affordable Care Act. We always pay close attention to what's happening, so feel free to check with us if you have questions about any future changes to law or how it could impact you. Just as a reminder, the Affordable Care Act consumer protections still exist. Preventative measures still have to be covered by insurance plans, 
young adults stay on their plan through age 26. Health uh, insurance plans cannot impose lifetime limits and cannot discriminate against people with a pre-existing condition. If you're looking to purchase insurance through your state's marketplace or healthcare.gov, we are getting to a critically important time of year. It's important to keep in mind that you can that you can only purchase or change plans during open enrollment or if you're eligible for a special enrollment period. For healthcare.gov, open enrollment is from November 1st to January 15th. However, in order to have coverage starting January 1st, 2024, one must enroll by December 15th, 2023. If one enrolls from December 16th, 2023 to January 15th, 2024, coverage will begin February 1st, 2024. Some states have their own private online marketplace, while others use healthcare.gov. When you enter your information on healthcare.gov, if your state has its own marketplace, you'll be directed to that marketplace website. Something that's important to highlight is that the open enrollment time is limited to six weeks. And unfortunately, this can reduce enrollment. States that run their own health insurance marketplaces can and do have the option to extend this period. Another thing to keep in mind is that regardless of when your state's open enrollment period ends, if you want coverage for January 1st, you generally have to apply for December by December 15th. And as you can see there on your screen is a list of different states and um, the various deadlines. It is a good idea to check with your state's marketplace as soon as possible to confirm your state's deadline for applying for coverage. Oh, here we go. This is actually the screen uh, where you can see the states that have um, the different times. So I'll just pause for a moment. And that is a link to the state's individual exchange, uh, which is featured on your screen. Plans in the health insurance marketplace are organized by metal categories, bronze, silver, gold, and platinum. The categories are based on how you and your plans split the cost of your medical care. The quality of care is the same. For bronze plans, the insurance company pays 60% of cost and you pay 40%. For platinum plans, the insurance company pays 90% of cost and you pay 10%. <clears throat> it may be tempting to buy the cheapest plan the one with the lowest monthly cost. But some of those plans with lower premiums may end up costing you more in the long run. That's if they have higher deductibles or higher out-of-pocket costs. When you enter in your income on the website, you'll learn whether there are tax credits to help you lower the cost of your insurance premiums each month. If the cost of the benchmark plan, which is the second lowest cost silver plan available, is greater than 8.5%, of someone's annual income, they may be eligible for a tax credit for the difference. This credit can be used to buy a more expensive or less expensive plan than the benchmark plan. In addition to price, when you're shopping for plans, compare the different insurance company plans. Depending on where you live, there may be options or only a few in each category. If you like your doctors and providers, First, check with the providers to see which marketplace plans they accept. You might want to choose your plan based on doctors in the network. An example is when our, um, when our office had a previous health insurance company, we had a slightly different network of doctors than we do now after we changed plans. Tax credits are now available for people under age 65 who purchase coverage on their own in a health insurance exchange and are not covered through their employer, Medicare, or Medicaid. Premium tax credits will be available to help people pay for health insurance that will cap premiums on a sliding scale from zero to 8.5% of income. Tax credits are used when you enroll and are paid directly to the cost of your health plan. Try to keep your costs down. You do not need to wait until you file a tax return at the end of the year. Tax credits are only available through the exchanges. You must enroll in a health plan through your state's healthcare exchange or healthcare.gov if you want to use your tax credits. At the end of the year, the tax credits may be adjusted if your annual income is different than you anticipated. That means you'll want to notify your state's healthcare exchange or healthcare.gov if your income changes. 
it's always a good idea to look at your options off the exchange if you aren't eligible for financial assistance. For example, if you're on Medicare or if you earn more than 400% of the federal poverty line. Some plans may be less expensive. You can always go directly to the health insurer's website or call a broker. The same plans might be available off the exchange and may even be less expensive. And here is just a little bit more information about um, the health insurance marketplace coverage and tax credits. Before 2021, if someone earned more than 400% of the federal poverty limit, they could not get a tax credit for the health insurance marketplace. But the American Rescue Plan eliminated this limitation for 2021 and 2022. The Inflation Reduction Act extended this through 2025. So there's no earning limit. You won't pay more than 8.5% of your income for a premium for a health insurance plan on the marketplace. If you're curious what the process looks like to shop for an insurance policy, let's use Covered California as an example. These are the questions to, they ask to determine your rates. They, the most challenging part of this can be entering your household income because you're supposed to anticipate what your income will be next year, but as we all know, that can definitely change. That can be tough if you're contemplating leaving your job or if you're in and out of the workforce. If you're curious what the process looks like and want to learn even more, there are also ways to search for doctors and facilities. However, although these systems have improved since year one, I strongly encourage you to call the doctor or hospital directly to confirm whether they accept marketplace insurance plans. Many facilities have decided not to accept insurance plans due to the lower reimbursement rates. So don't just assume that because your doctor accepts an employer-sponsored Blue Shield or Kaiser plan, that they will also accept Blue Shield through Covered California. Make sure you ask. This is especially true if you have surgeries or other follow-up appointments scheduled. The most important thing for you may be to stay with a specific doctor. In that case, I would ask the doctor or facility first which plans they accept and then use that information to search for those plans either on or off the marketplace. Here are a few examples of some plans that were available in the Los Angeles area. I know it's very small, but you can compare the prices of these bronze plans. There are generally more HMOs and EPOs in the marketplace this year for anyone with a chronic, complex chronic health condition. A PPO is probably going to provide more flexibility and will likely have a broader network of doctors, even if premiums are higher. Here's an example of a silver blue shield plan that was available in the Los Angeles area. You'll initially see the monthly premium, deductible, primary care visits, et cetera. If you're on the actual website, you can click on compare or summary of benefits and coverage. That way you'll get to see a lot more information about the plan. You may be particularly interested to learn about the prescription drug benefit. Thus, it's important to check the formulary of the plans you're looking at if there are specific prescriptions you need. I want to flag that if you are eligible for Medicare or Medicaid, you will not be eligible to get tax credits or other cost savings if you purchase insurance through the insurance marketplace. Just to clarify some vocabulary, Medicare is for those 65 or older and enrollment begins within three months of one's 65th birthday or those under 65 but who have been receiving SSDI for 24 months or people that have end-stage renal disease. You still become eligible for Medicare at age 65 even if you have to wait until 66 or 67 to collect your Social Security retirement benefits. You do have to have worked long enough or have enough work credits to be eligible for free Part A Medicare. However, Medicare eligibility is not specifically tied to whether or not you are currently receiving retirement benefits. Traditional Medicaid is generally for those who meet categorical requirements, aged, blind, disabled, according to Social Security, and have limited resources, taking into account things you own, cash on hand, but excluding the home you live in and the car you use.
Medicare's open enrollment begins October 15th. So that's just in a few days as of the date of this recording. You will be able to go to Medicare.gov to make changes to various aspects of your coverage. You will be able to switch between original Medicare and Medicare Advantage, depending on what works best for you. Even if you're dissatisfied with your plan, it is a good idea to look at what option, if you, even if you are satisfied with your plan, it is a good idea to look at what options are out there. Also, plans change from year to year, and so can your healthcare needs. Medicare enrollment periods, initial is from three months before your 65th birthday until three months afterwards. Open enrollment, once a year, currently between October 15th and December 7th. So that is a crucial time period where right now, um, and this is why we do our webinar every year during this time, is to really educate and provide information about these important deadlines. However, it is open enrollment, so there might be an opportunity for you to at least check in, confirm that your plan is the best option for you, or consider some other opportunities. These are 2023 numbers. Your tax returns are used to calculate Medicare costs. It is based on your modified adjusted gross income. Part A is free for many people. In other words, they have no premium. A person would only have to purchase Part A coverage if they are over 65 but have never paid into Social Security. This generally only applies to people who have no Social Security work history or insufficient work history, such as a stay-at-home parent. For people who pay a Part A premium, the 2021 Part A monthly premium is $506 a month if you paid Medicare taxes for less than 30 quarters or $278 if you paid Medicare taxes for 30 to 39 quarters. The Part A Medicare inpatient deductible is $1,600 in 2023. The average 2023 Part B premium is $164.90 per month or higher depending on income. There's also an annual deductible of $226 per year in 2023 which may apply to certain services. People with high incomes, such as 97,000 individually, 194,000 for married couples, have a higher Part B premium, while those with limited incomes may be eligible for a Medicare savings program for help with paying their Part B premium. In a Part C plan, you generally must pay the Medicare Part B premium. Some Medicare Advantage plans may also charge you with an additional premium. On average, Medicare Advantage premiums still decline, will, will decline while plan choices and new benefits increase. On average, Medicare Advantage premiums in 2023 are $19. Costs vary by plan, but the average monthly premium for Medicare Part D is $32.74 in 2023. People with high incomes have a higher Part D premium. The deductible varies by plan as well. For Part D, Medicare offers different levels of low-income subsidies, called extra help, which can be applied for by submitting an application to Social Security. These pay the cost of prescription drugs above and beyond a standard Part D prescription drug plan. To qualify, you need to receive Medicare and have low income and assets. To qualify in 2023 for extra help, a single person had to save $21,870 or less of annual income. Here are some resources. Like I said, we are the Cancer Legal Resource Center, so I want to make sure that you have resources. We highly recommend the Medicare Rights Center and your state insurance, health insurance assistance program. For additional Medicare resources, you can contact our office through our online intake as well. Also, check the requirements and eligibility if your state has a health insurance premium payment program. And I just want to say, even, since this presentation is recorded, of course you can take notes throughout it. But if there's a certain website or information from your screen that you'd like to jot down, you can always go straight to that part in the recorded presentation and pause it and take all the time that you need. Um, also, if there's a part that you want to make sure that you listen to again, you can fast forward to that particular part. And of course, you can definitely watch the entire presentation. While our healthcare system was greatly reformed through the ACA, that was a great start, but we still have a long way to go. There are still many people who fall through the cracks and who cannot afford coverage. 
many people with an undocumented immigration status or those who live in states that haven't expanded Medicaid need to find other ways to get medical treatment. If you can't get healthcare during any of the ways we've talked about, here are some options. Hill Burton, that's a congressional law which gave hospitals and other health facilities money for construction and modernization. In return, the facilities that received these funds agreed to provide a reasonable volume of service to people unable to pay. While the program stopped providing funds in the late 1990s, certain healthcare facilities are still obligated to provide free or reduced cost care. You can call the national hotline to get a list of obligated facilities. There's a separate contact number for Maryland residents. Charity care. Many hospitals have free or low cost care available to low income patients. Speak with a social worker or the patient services department at your local hospital to determine what options may be available. Hospitals cannot charge uninsured individuals who qualify for financial assistance more than what they charge insured patients. The limitation on gross charges applies to all hospital care, not just emergency care. Private health insurance. Although this can be an expensive option, anyone can purchase private health insurance uh, as long as they do so directly from an insurance company or through an insurance broker. Now we've gotten to part three. Sometimes a phone call can result in a lot of savings, and other times a formal appeal needs to be made, but it starts with knowing your plan. Now that you know what kind of insurance you have and some of the basics about insurance generally and how to maximize that coverage, I wanna talk a little bit about some of the rules about coverage, as well as some of the options you have if you need to purchase new coverage. Now that we have discussed marketplace insurance, covered Medicaid and Medicare, I'm going to briefly discuss COBRA and state COBRA. If you are employed or were recently employed, COBRA, Consolidated Omnibus Reconciliation Act, allows you to continue on your employer insurance for a period of time even after you are no longer an employee. COBRA is a federal law that provides for continuation of coverage. Under COBRA, a former employee keeps the same insurance if they lose their job or drop below the number of hours required to get insurance through their job, or if they lose coverage their spouse is providing by divorce, legal separation or death, or they become entitled to Medicare. It's expensive, but it may be the best option for people currently going through treatment. A patient can continue the same insurance coverage from their employer without having to switch doctors. So if someone feels strongly that they need to see their doc specific doctor for as long as possible, even if the cost is higher, this could be a good option. Most people know about COBRA, but many people don't know that some states have laws similar to COBRA that apply to employers with fewer than 20 employees or that extend the time period that a person may be eligible for continued coverage. For example, in California, Cal COBRA applies to employers with two to 19 employees and lasts up to 18 months. Or for those working for an employer of 20 or more employees, this law may extend regular COBRA coverage for another 18 months, equaling up to 36 months of coverage. Cal COBRA is more expensive, and during the time you're on Cal COBRA, you could be responsible for up to 110% of the premiums. If you're under 65, you may notice that there are certain gaps in the insurance system. The first is that a person is only eligible for Medicaid and Medicare, um, for Medicare if they are under 65 and have been receiving SSDI for two years. And I just want to jump back, you know, just for a second, you know, before we go to the Medicare gaps and to see a little bit more about COBRA, I just want to give a moment uh, to look at that slide, because it is something that can be very important to someone affected by cancer. And now as we move on to this, this important topic, that a person under 65 who becomes disabled has a minimum period of two years before they can access Medicare. After receiving SSDI, a person who was previously eligible for Medicaid due to low income may lose it due to the income they're receiving from SSDI. This creates a problem of figuring out how to get insurance while you wait for Medicare to kick in. Options include COBRA, purchasing insurance through the healthcare exchange, 
Some states provide assistance to making COBRA payments through programs such as health insurance premium payment programs, known as HIP. In addition to these gaps, while awaiting Medicare to kick in, plans that might be required through insurance companies to supplement Medicare, such as Medigap plans or Medicare Advantage plans, are currently allowed to hike up prices to people that are under 65 because they believe that the cost for a person who's disabled may exceed the cost for an average person reaching age 65. We also have some helpful resources on our website, including a step-by-step -step guide to insurance appeals and a handout with information about accessing prescription drugs. Here are some other related areas for accessing insurance-related resources. And I'm just going to pause, even though this presentation is recorded, I just want to pause to give the opportunity in real time for someone to take down those websites or any of that information. We have now reached the end of the presentation on health insurance options. Thank you so much for your attention. If you have general questions about today's presentation or need some clarification, I'll take some time for questions. I won't log off just yet, but I'll end the recording now to answer questions if there are any. Thank you so much for participating in this presentation. I know your time is very valuable, so thank you so much for spending that time with us.